So y'all ready to jump into today's message? Because I am ready to jump in. We are in this series called Holy Spirit. And we're learning that he's our advocate, that he is our guide, that Jesus made it very clear that he had to leave, that his ministry time on earth had come to an end and he had to go so that we could be given the Holy Spirit. We learned that not only is the Holy Spirit our advocate, but he is our lawyer, not just our lawyer. Come on, we're lawyering up around here, but we also, he's our comforter. He's there to remind us of truth, to convince us of God's love, and to convict us of our sin. He is incredible, come on, and he is active, and I'm so grateful for him. And so I wanna go ahead, let's skip around two slides. Let's go all the way go to here. I wanna talk about two things today, two things, because The thought and the idea around these are very important. So the two thoughts today, we're gonna talk about spiritual struggle because we we do live in a spiritual struggle. We live in a constant struggle that we're gonna talk about. And then I wanna talk to you about pruning and blooming. Pruning and blooming. So let's get started. Let's talk about this. Oops, well, wrong one. This must be really important because I hit the button. So here we go. Two services, 9, 30, and 11. Don't forget about that. We're excited, yeah! My husband's like, yeah, you better talk about that, right? <laughs> Do so, we're excited. So September 11th, that is why we're doing our prayer walk next week to let our community know that that is happening. Now, let's talk about spiritual struggle. You and I on the daily are faced with this. And I wanna look at the word struggle because as a verb, to struggle means to contend. Contend means to wrestle. So on the daily, I am wrestling with an adversary or an opposing force. Now, if you have been in a church for a long time, you may have heard the term adversary as we're talking about the enemy, that Satan is our adversary. But I also want to talk about a different adversary, a different opposing force, because struggle can also be a noun, which means it's a war. It's a, it's a fight. It's a conflict. It's a contesting of any kind. And there is an internal struggle. And so let's go to Galatians chapter 5. Because if anybody in the Bible is just a a teacher on struggle, it is the Apostle Paul. He is an incredible teacher because he knows that the struggle is real because it was real in his life. And so if you have your Bible, you can go on to your U version. You can open up your Bible or you can follow along on the screens. Galatians chapter 5 verse 13. It says, for you have been called. He's talking to you. That if you've accepted Jesus Christ into your life, that he is your Lord and Savior, you are called to live in freedom my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law, meaning all of God's word, can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. And I love this, hear me. Because we can say that the greatest command can be summed up in this one thought of love your neighbor as yourself. But come on, I can't do that on my own. I can't do that on my own. I can't love the unlovable very well on my own. I have a hard time even loving the lovable, come on, on my own. And so the Holy Spirit is called to guide us in our lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature, and this is what I'm talking about, that adversary. This is what I'm talking about when I'm saying we're in a spiritual struggle, that there is an opposition built into us against the things of God. So the sinful nature wants to do evil which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces. So he's recognizing that both of these have some movement in our lives. They are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Now, I wanna tell you that I love that the Apostle Paul said to carry out your good intentions. What he's doing, he's saying, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. I believe that you want to do your best. I believe that you do have good intentions in you, but I'm recognizing that there are opposing forces that sometimes get the best of us. So maybe you were waking up this morning with the best of intentions, but somebody copped an attitude at your house. (laughs) And you didn't stay in those best intentions. Come on, you copped an attitude right back. Or maybe even, it's not even 10.30 in the morning. And maybe you've already had adversity come to you and you didn't show up at your best. 
Can I tell you, friends, that that's okay? We all don't hit the mark every single time, but most likely you woke up this morning wanting to carry out some good intentions. See, we have to understand that the spirit opposes the sinful nature. And the sinful nature opposes the spirit. So it's not like one person just doesn't like the other. It's that they really hate each other. But the problem is both of them are living in your body. That's the hard part. This is the reality of humanity. The reality of humanity is that you in your earthly, living, breathing body carry both a sinful nature and carry the Spirit of God, right? That's hard. That in me right now, I have two forces working against each other, one opposing sinful nature and one opposing the Spirit. And yet, both of these are part of who I am. Well, thanks, Lynn. That sounds really hopeful and exciting. Where are we going from here? Well, there is not only a reality of humanity, but there is a hope of humanity. And the hope of humanity is that as I lean into my relationship with Jesus, as I allow the Holy Spirit to come more and more into my life, and hear me, this doesn't mean how many years I've been in a relationship with the Lord. Friends, we could be in a relationship with the Lord for 30 years and we still haven't let him into areas in our lives. So it really has nothing to do with longevity in time. It has to do with how much investment, leaning in, hard work, vulnerable work, being honest, am I doing in this relationship with Jesus? So I don't want you to look at this and be like, that's gonna take me 45 years, Lindsay. This could take 45 minutes. I don't know, however the Lord wants to do it, I'm not sure. But the hope of humanity is, is that the Spirit of God starts taking up more residency in our lives. And that sinful nature, hear me, it's never going to be gone from your life. It's never going to be gone until you are face to face in the presence of God. That's the reality. You will never be perfect on this earth. You will only be made into perfection when either Jesus comes down for us or we die and go to him. That's the only way. And until then, even though that will never be absent from my life, the spirit in God of God in me can take up more space in my life than the sinful nature. And the things that used to take me and overpower me so quickly, the responses I used to give on a dime, those things will be lengthened. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. So friends, this is gonna be a hopeful, can you say hopeful? This is gonna be a hopeful message this morning. So we talked about the spiritual struggle, that all of us have this sinful nature. And I hope that brings to you a sigh of relief, like, you know, we have a saying in our house that we don't do perfection, we do repentance. And in all transparency, we did a whole lot of repentance this weekend. (laughs) We, it was just, our house was in a funk this week. And there was a lot of repentance, but we do not demand perfection in our home because we know that it is a false hope. It's not a reality, but we do repentance really well. That if I recognize that God, this is not right in my life, and because something is not right in my life, it spills over and often it spills over onto other people. And the people that are closest to me in proximity or relationship, they tend to get the brunt of my pouring over. And that is why we don't do perfection, we do repentance. That I take responsibility for that icky overflow that's spilled on you. And I believe with all my heart that God is still doing a work in me because I'm a work in progress, says Philippians chapter one, six. And I'm gonna be made more like Jesus every day, but I can humble myself and I can say I'm sorry. And I can do my best to, to do something different next time. Amen? So there is hope for Mary. So now that we know we're all on the struggle bus today, let's talk about pruning and blooming. Now, I'm gonna give you a disclaimer. There ain't a green thumb on this body. Ain't a green thumb. I go to my mama for anything that I need from a garden. If I can't buy it at Sprouts, I get it from my mom. If I don't know what it is, I get it from Google. You know, I, I, there's nothing about me that screams landscaper, harvester, gardener, okay? But I am a student of the word. And because I'm a student of the word, I am able to teach you in confidence today what the Bible says on this topic. And so let's go to John chapter 15 because Jesus is the best example of who we are supposed to follow. 
And he speaks very clearly and practically on this whole idea of pruning and blooming. So let's see what he says in John 15. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, will you say prunes? So that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Now you might be wondering, did Jesus have a green thumb? <laughs> no, he didn't. Jesus, I, no. <laughs> he had a holy thumb, but not a green thumb. But he was very good at talking in pictures for people. He taught parables often so that people can find common ground because this was very common for the Israelites. To talk about a vine and a grapevine and branches and fruit, that was language that they could get around, that they could clearly understand because they knew that those grapevines were cut back and pruned so that they would produce what? More grapes. This was a part of their everyday life. And so what do we take from this in regards to the Israelites? The people hearing from Jesus right when he is speaking this would say, okay, Jesus is the vine. That makes sense. Well, that would make sense because the vine is the life source of the branches. They would know that no branch can form without a vine. And no branch could ever bear fruit if it wasn't attached and abiding in the vine. But what does that mean for us? Because I don't know about you, but we don't live in Napa, right? We, we don't have these beautiful, lush, um, just gardens with grapes and all these things. We don't have that. But our takeaway in 2022 is that Jesus is my life source. What he is talking about, that he is the vine and we are the branches, that you and I are branches. And now I wanna go a little bit further into the gospels and into the New Testament. Because when he was talking to the Israelites, he was talking about specific blessings and promises to them. He was saying, guys, you're going off an old relationship with the law. But I need you to know that the law ain't gonna bear fruit in your life because you are not perfect on your own. There's not enough goodness in you or any accolades to get you to a place where you're bearing the kind of fruit that matters. And so Jesus was explaining to them that this, 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 this law isn't going to, I am the source of your life. I am going to, and if you want to bear fruit that matters, fruit that makes a difference in your life and in the lives of others, fruit that lasts for eternity, then I have to be plugged into your life and you have to stay plugged in to me. And so it's a beautiful thing and I love it because the Bible, Paul even catches a hold of this. And he says that you and I, right, we're not a part of the Israelites, but we were grafted in to God's family. We are grafted in to the vine. So you may be thinking, well, I didn't start growing off a vine. When you give your life to Jesus, you are automatically planted into that vine. It is like you are uprooted from your old life and you are placed directly onto the vine of Jesus. Are you following with what I'm saying, friends? Okay, he is our life source. So we are called to remain in him. In fact, it was so important that in those, just those two little scriptures, Jesus said the word remain four times. It means to abide. It means to be tightly knit to. And so how do we do this? Well, number one, we accept Jesus as our savior. Number two is not by the band journey. It is that you are not going to stop believing. You're going to remain even when times get tough. You're not going to uproot yourself from the vine. You're going to remain in Jesus. And then it's loving obedience. That Lord, I love you. I love your spirit. I love your word. And God, I'm gonna live the best that I can being and remaining in you and walking my life with you. See, I love it because Jesus showed these three things when he said, you're already clean. So Jesus already did the work by dying on the cross for us, that we are made right in the eyes of God because of Jesus. And so he's saying, you don't have to do anything to spruce yourself up to get on my vine. 
Like, you, I gave my life for you. I, I made the way, I paid the price so that you could be a part of my vine. And so bring your branch over here and let's get this relationship started. And he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. Stay in. Remain in, even when things are tough, even when loss is, is, is brought into our lives, whatever you are experiencing, remain in Jesus. And when we remain, we lovingly obey. We obey his word. We obey the guiding of the spirit. We just, we obey and lean in. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is why we're doing things like rooted. Because we understand that Okay, God, you are my life source, and I'm going to grow in you, and this is going to be incredible. But, but how do I secure my life in you? How do I get better rooted in the things of God to help me make it through the times when I just want to quit this whole thing called faith? How do you get me through when what I'm praying for, Father, I'm having a hard time hanging in there? How do I, how do I stay the course when, e I messed up? And, and I don't feel worthy to come back, God. And, and, and I feel a little bit shamed. And, but what, I go back to his word and I realize that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That I am always a part of the family. He's never left me nor forsaken me. And so if I mess up, I need to brush my knees off, get back up again and come back. I'm there, I'm there. And so things like Rooted, a discipleship program that we are launching on September 11th, that is going to help us Stay close to the vine. And so I would really encourage you, go to avenuechurch.cc slash rooted because we have rooted groups happening all around the valley this fall. And it's gonna be an incredible thing to lean into and to be a part of. So Jesus said, I'm the vine, but God is the gardener. He's the gardener. Now I really do want you to picture a beautiful, lush garden. And I want you to picture a person Right, like get detailed with it. We, we love the big hats, right? Because it blocks us from the sun. Like imagine the gloves and the tools. Imagine someone who's enjoying what they're doing. They're not rushing through the garden. They're having an experience in the garden. It's not a to-do list so I can get to my next garden. It's, it's who I am. I'm the gardener. And I want you to picture him lovingly walking around, caring for, inspecting, enjoying himself in the presence of all the branches and flowers and trees. He's the gardener. Now, one thing that we have to understand about God is that the Bible tells us that God is love, that, that love does not exist apart from God because he is the source of God, the word, or the source of love. Those words are interchangeable. God is love, love is God. But we need to know that love prunes. Love prunes. So here's where I'm going to be a pretend gardener. You ready for this? Let's look, at the, let's look at the experts. Pruning is the most important operation for maintaining the fruitfulness of the vine. A completely fruitless branch is not worthy of its place in the vine and has to be removed. So if there is a branch where nothing is coming out of this branch, it needs to be removed. Whereas weak branches can be strengthened by being pruned. Notice it doesn't say perfect branches get pruned. Only perfect and pretty branches, all put together branches, those are the ones that are gonna get God's attention. No, no, he's looking for weak areas in our lives that if the gardener prunes them lovingly, they can actually become very strong. And so we have to look at our lives that as Jesus is the vine and we are the branches, that good and loving gardener is going to come into our lives from time to time and prune some areas in our lives. He's gonna prune some areas in our lives. And as you guys are probably getting a little bit nervous here, like, oh, dear Jesus, what are, you what are you gonna prune in my life? We need to understand there's a difference between cutting off and cutting back. I think sometimes we're so afraid to allow God into certain areas of our lives because he's gonna cut it off instead of cut it back. You know, when, when, if you study out the word of God and you're reading on theologians and commentaries and things that support scripture and history, you'll learn that the branch that he was talking about that would be cut off was Judas. 
Judas was one of the disciples, the one who betrayed him, the one that never had a purpose in the Lord or, or God moving inside of him. He was a tool. He, he was never, he, there was never hope for Judas. And so when we talk about cutting off, that for the person who is without the Lord, there may be a cutting off at the end of days. But for the person who's walking in the Lord and yet stumbling, or walking in the Lord and yet a little bit weak, you're not getting cut off. You're gonna get cut back. It's not cut back where you're gonna go to the back of the line or you don't get to be in the pretty spot of the garden. No, no, no. It's that God's gotta do some trimming, some pruning in our lives. I remember um, back in December of 2019, I was diagnosed with endometriosis. Now endometriosis is a tissue disease that a tissue that is only supposed to grow in one part of your body and function only in that part. Doctors can't explain how or why, but it ends up growing in different parts of your body and it hurts those parts of the body. It's like a weed, it grows and it contracts and constricts and it causes a lot of damage. And so in December of 2019, I had a skilled doctor that was able to go into my body through laparoscopic surgery and remove it. And what's so great about this doctor is that he was not only able to remove the bad tissue that was hurting me, he was able to extract everything around it so that tissue would never grow back in that place again. And it left a hole in my body the size of a softball, which I thought was very funny because I spent 10 years playing softball in my youth. And so when he knew that analogy, I'm like, good Lord, that's not the size of a baseball, that's a softball. Ouch, right? Do I need that? <laughs> But you know, I didn't have any organs cut off. I didn't lose anything that was important. But he did take away things that could be corrupted had it not been extracted. And the surgery was painless because I was under anesthesia. In fact, my scars are so small because technology is incredible that he didn't go in with his hands, he went in with robots and did it. And you would, you would look at me and you'd never know that I have that much missing from my body. But the recovery was awful. After the anesthesia had worn off, and when I had to learn to start functioning and using my body again, that was excruciating. It was worse than the surgery. Can I tell you that when God cuts things out of our lives, we're not under anesthesia when he does it, okay? We're not under anesthesia. And it often feels that the process of removing it hurts really bad in that moment. But I can tell you that the recovery time is like that. When we get into a place where God, because this is what we're fearing, right? When we think about pruning, right? Your girl's visual. I'm a teacher at heart. Oh. When we think about pruning, we're picturing like the little gardener, right? Like, I got a little bit of an attitude, Lord. You can come and you can bring your, see, I'm not even a pruner because I don't know how to open these. <laughs> Figured it out. Okay. But we think he's just going to come in and that's what we do in church, right? We, we inch our way towards God. We inch our way towards the Holy Spirit and say, eh, maybe I'll pray about that. Maybe, just maybe I'll talk about this and God, let's see what you want to do. And sometimes it's just a little bit of this. Sometimes it's like, oh, sweetie, you just have a little, a little dead little thingy right here. Like if you just go, it's going to be great. And it's going to prune, right? But then other times, the tool gets a little bit bigger. Because sometimes we've got stuff that's a little bit harder in our lives. A little bit thicker and might need something a little bit more strong to cut off. Now, if, if this doesn't do it, the fear is, right? Lord, are you gonna hack me? Right? I know how to use this. <laughs> are you gonna come at me with a hedger, Lord? And are you just gonna start doing whatever you wanna do? What is this? Is this gonna hurt me? Justin, you're already making your way up. Come on up. Because your girl's not a professional, I called in a professional. Yeah. yeah. Woo! Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Justin. But then there's things in our lives that are really rough, right? Okay. 
Yeah. See? Oh, that's real. Sorry. Can you do that again? I just squirted you. Are you okay? <laughs> I really am sorry. One more time. Okay. <laughs> yes. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Okay. Now, I'll keep this right my toes. But there's times where God, where it feels like, He's gonna perform a surgery without anesthesia, and there's these like really hard parts. You take this away, I'm sorry. It's terrifying. No, I'm good. Here, here, we're good, we're good, we're good. I don't need any more. <laughs> Everybody give Justin a hand once. <gasps> Woo! Online, you can't smell it, but it smells like gas. All right. But I say all that to give you a visual because so many times we don't lean into this pruning process that God is offering in our lives because we think he's going to use tools like that to, to change things in our lives. But can I tell you that God is a gardener, not a butcher. And we often think that he's going to come to us as a butcher. We're going to look nothing like what we looked before. We're going to be just completely different in all the bad ways. But we have to understand, he wants the best for you. He wants the best for you. And so although I remember, oh gosh, this was a, quite a few years ago. I remember sitting at lunch with my mentor because often God will use people to get you in the position to be pruned. And when Pastor Helen asks you for lunch, you don't say no to Pastor Helen. She's beautiful, she's in her 70s, and she'd asked me to lunch one day. And as I'm sitting with her, I could tell the Holy Spirit was using her because she was leading the conversation in a way where I knew it was going to go somewhere. And here we are, this is how, this is how dated it is, it was at the Elephant Bar that's not even there anymore in the district. But we're sitting at the Elephant Bar, and as the Holy Spirit's guiding her, I say out of my mouth, I'm prideful. Prideful. And here, over my lunch, over a conversation with one of the most beautiful women in the world, I start bawling. And so she asks for the check, and we go back to her house. And she goes, do you want to go up to pastor's office and pray? You see, my pastor had died. He had passed away, but his, his library was fully intact. And she gave me the safe space to go up in his library and bawl my eyes out to get on my hands and knees and say, God, holy smokes, I'm prideful. And I need you, I want you to remove it because I don't want to walk out the rest of my days still living with this in my life. Because not only am I hurting myself, my pride had hurt other people, people that I loved and people that I cared about. And so I can't even tell you, I didn't even use tissue. I was like, no, that's the expensive stuff. Give me a roll of toilet paper. Like I took the toilet paper. I went through almost an entire roll of toilet paper just crying. And she let me. And that day, God, it felt like God was using what Justin had. It felt like a chainsaw hacking up my heart in that moment. But when I walked out of that room, there was a peace that I could not even comprehend or explain to people. God had uprooted something that was taking too much space in my life. And so when I tell you that God is a gardener and not a butcher, the process of being pruned may not always tickle. It may not always feel good. But your recovery is like that. You walk up and you get up feeling not like you're out for six weeks on bed rest, but that you're walking out a new man or a new woman because God just did a good and a lasting work in me and I'm not getting up off this floor the same. And hear me, you're not scarred. The only scars that come from pruning are the scars that Jesus has on his hands and on his feet from being nailed to the cross. Pruning does not leave scars. In fact, it heals them and it heals wounds. And so I want to encourage us, friends, we cannot be spiritually mature and be emotionally immature. That does not make a healthy Christian. And it was both spiritual immaturity and emotional immaturity that pride was rising up in Lindsay. Can you imagine if I had never had that uprooted and pruned from my life? Can you imagine that girl leading you here at Avenue? Could you imagine the shame I would have placed on people? 
And some of you are like, no, Lindsay, you're so sweet. Why, thank you for that, but I won't always. <laughs> Can you imagine what I'd be projecting onto people? That you had to get it right all the time. You have to be perfect all the time. It's got to get, it's just, can you imagine how I'd be leading and caring for people? And I think sometimes we wonder, God, why aren't you moving me more in life? Why am I not always getting those promotions? Or why aren't these dreams arising in my life in a quicker time frame? Maybe because God needs to do some pruning, pruning to uphold you in that position that you're desiring. Man. You know, I've been a Christ follower for 20 years. In no way am I perfect. I'm never going to be. But I'm better in my 30s than I was in my 20s. And 40s are just around the corner, and I'm just so looking forward to it in some ways. <laughs> He's like, liar. <laughs> a little bit, okay? I'm getting too many grades right now. But whatever. I'm going to be better in my 40s than I was in my 30s. And I'm better in my 30s than my 20s. And it's because I'm open to whatever tool he wants to use because I know that that moment of what feels like surgical removing of something, that pain's gonna be over like that. And I'm gonna be walking out in freedom. Sometimes, you guys, comfort is keeping you from freedom. And instead of using anesthesia, we're using pills and alcohol, we're using relationships and sex, and we're using all these things. Some of us, it's just binging on TV. It's surfing all the time, scrolling all the time, because I don't want to feel. But the very thing that you are avoiding may be the very thing that God wants to prune. And once he prunes it, then you will be able to walk in freedom. But when you are trying to be your own anesthesiologist, God is saying, I don't want to work with you when you're numb. I need you present. And I need you to trust me that I'm a good gardener. I'm not putting on surgical gloves. You've got my hands. My loving, comforting hands to see you through this. You know what's beautiful about this is that the Holy Spirit has a role in all this. You, we believe in the Trinity here at Avenue Church. We believe that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Three unique personas of Jesus, of God, but all one person. Three in one. And this is such a beautiful, beautiful showing of this because you see the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in your life. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. There's nothing that stands against these things. You see, the Holy Spirit produces fruit. So while Jesus is the vine, my good, loving, and faithful Father is the gardener, the Holy Spirit brings the fruit. He produces the fruit. And let me show you how beautiful this is. It's fruit of mind. See, here at Avenue Church, we believe that you're a whole person. That it's not just our responsibility to love and help you grow just in the spiritual things. We believe that you are mind, body, and soul. Your mind, heart, and soul. We care about all of that. So the fruit of your mind is love. Love is the foundation of everything. Joy, it rests in God's sovereign control of things. It's not circumstantial, but the fruit of the Spirit, which is joy. Hear me, these are not fruits. It doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. It says that when the Holy Spirit produces fruit in your life, these things work in unison. So it's not like, oh, I'm so sorry. You only get a little bit, you get joy. And over here, you're, you're gonna have love. And, and you, Jeff, you, you get some patience. No, 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 all of these things are able to be in your life and be produced in your life as someone who is attached to the vine, come on, and has God as a gardener. And then there's peace. It's an inner repose. That just means it's an inner quietness. It's an inner rest that it defies human understanding. How do I have peace when everything is falling apart? It's this kind of peace. It's rest, and it defies human understanding. So these are fruit of my mind. What about fruit of my heart? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, which is gentleness. See, patience is the quality, and hear me, I, I need you to hear this, because when we think of patience, we think of, oh, you can wait in line for a long time. When you're in patience, you can hear your kid nag and not want to hit them, right? That's what we hear. Oh, is that just me? <laughs> right? Quap. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to talk about healthy humans in our next series, okay? We'll get healthy. 
But patience is the quality of forbearance under provocation, meaning that you're being provoked. It entertains no thoughts of retaliation, even when wrongfully treated. So patience is, is that I don't want to buck up against you when you're bucking up against me. Patience is that I have the fortitude. I have the forbearance to, I'm not even thinking about retaliating you, even though you're being a butt. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Kindness, it's shown to sinner and to saint and to yourself. I think some of you are really good at being kind to other people, but you're not very kind to yourself. Goodness, it's reaching out to others to do good even when it's not deserved. Do you see these things? These aren't produced by our own strength. These don't come from sinful nature. This comes from the Holy Spirit being at work in our lives. What about fruit of the soul? Faithfulness, you're trustworthy and you're reliable. Gentleness, you're considerate of others when discipline is needed. I love that he, he brings discipline and gentleness together. He's saying, I need you to be considerate of the whole story, the whole picture when you are about to go and discipline or correct, be considerate of all of the aspects going on here. It's amazing. And then self-control. You're curbing fleshly impulses. I'm making that sinful nature not have so much residency in my life. You and I are called to bear fruit. We're called to bear fruit, but I do wanna tell you, there is such thing as an ornamental fruit tree. And an ornamental fruit tree is a tree that blossoms and it looks like it should be bearing fruit. And it's beautiful and it's attractive, but it's not gonna produce edible fruit. We're not called to be ornamental trees. We're not called to just look pretty and attractive and okay, I look like someone who might be attached to the life source of Jesus. No, I'm authentically imperfect, but I really do love the Lord. And so there is nothing about me that's ornamental. I am authentic and I'm still gonna bloom. I'm imperfect and I'm still gonna bloom. And as the Holy Spirit is allowed more and more access to my life, I'm going to bear fruit that lasts. I'm gonna end with this. I love this because Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your what? Heart, love, joy, peace, right? Patience, kindness, goodness, with all your soul and with all your mind. So what God has called you to do, the Holy Spirit is producing all the fruit that goes along with that. So God is never going to ask you to do something that he hasn't already equipped you with all the resources and all the tools to be able to do it. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. Come on, how good is God? How good is God? He's so good, okay. So I'm gonna call you guys up front. We're gonna get a chainsaw. No, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. I actually wanna pray for you right now and then we're gonna close and our host is gonna come up. Would you please bow your heads and close your eyes just for privacy? If you are in the room today and you are saying, Lindsay, there are some areas in my life that need to be pruned, but man, I've been avoiding the gardener. But I'm realizing that I need to invite the gardener to do his work. If that is you and you're saying, yep, there's some areas in my life that need to be pruned, will you raise your hand? Raise your hand, I wanna know who I'm praying for. That's awesome, that's awesome. There's hands up all over, hands up all over. I'm gonna pray for you real quick. You can put your hands down. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray right now that there would be trust and assurance that you desire good things for them. You desire good things for us. And that we would allow you access, space, Father, to be able to prune what you want to prune in our lives so that we can bear fruit. I pray right now in the name of Jesus, I just, I, I really truly believe that someone here, you're afraid to, to be pruned because you don't know what it's gonna look like. You're afraid of what you're gonna lose. But the fruit that you are going to produce in your life what used to be is nowhere in comparison to what's going to be. So I'm praying specifically for you to have eyes to see what is going to be in the mighty name of Jesus. If you are here today and you are not connected to the vine, you're like, Lindsay, I do not have a personal relationship with Jesus and I want, I want to be 
I want him to be my life source. Is that as you? Will you please raise your hand? I'm gonna pray for you. I'm gonna pray for you. It's awesome. Yes, I see you. I see you. I see you. Let's say this together as a church family. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for giving your life for me. Today, I repent of my sins. I thank you that you clean me. I thank you that you make me right. I ask right now that I could be a branch attached to your vine. I believe in Jesus' name that you're bringing good fruit in my life. I give you permission to prune so I can bloom in Jesus' name. Come on, amen and amen and amen.